Platformers are incredibly hard to write. Even if you take away the power-ups, complex level mechanics, and enemy AI, you still need to handle the controls. Mess those up and the game will feel bad, meaning no one's going to want to play it. So in this episode, I'm going to break down one of the quintessential examples of a game with good controls, Super Mario 3, and show you how to write the code that makes Mario move. Character movement in an NES game is usually achieved by combining two types of animation. First, there's the keyframe animation for the character itself, which is used to show how a character is moving. And second, there's the change in position on the screen over time. To create nice looking motion, the trick is to change the position for the character sprites by only a small amount from frame to frame. That said, because the coordinates for a sprite are stored as integers, the minimum amount you can move a sprite in a single frame is one pixel, which is kind of a problem. Okay, so here's a character I made moving at zero pixels per frame. Amazing, I know, but look at what happens when he accelerates to one pixel per frame. It's kind of jerky, right? And it gets even worse as you accelerate further. On the flip side, take a look at how Mario moves. In comparison, his acceleration is way smoother. The issue here is that while a single pixel might seem small, the NES is rendering at 60 frames a second. And by doing some quick math, it's easy to show that one pixel per frame is equal to 60 pixels per second. So accelerating this way causes the character to go from zero to 60 instantaneously Spontaneously, which explains why it feels a little unnatural. Thankfully, there's a pretty simple way to remedy this. Instead of jumping to 60 pixels per second directly, you just need to do it across multiple steps by hitting a few of the numbers in between. But like I said, the smallest amount of sprite can move per frame is one pixel, which means you'd need to be able to accelerate by fractions of a pixel in order to achieve the effect. Clearly it's possible, because pretty much every NES game does this, but how exactly do you code something like that? Talk to anyone who's deep in the speedrunning community for SMB3, and they'll tell you. The way that the game has such smooth movement is because it uses something called subpixels. A subpixel is exactly what it sounds like. It's a fraction of a pixel. The idea is that you store the position and speed for the character in terms of subpixels, then do all the motion calculations in that format. After all the acceleration and movement is done, you can then convert from subpixels to screen coordinates and use the resulting number to position the sprites. By doing things this way, a game can perform much more granular transitions, all while working within the limitations of how the NES stores sprite coordinates. Technically speaking, subpixels are an application of a technique known as fixed point numbers, which pretty much everyone watching this video already knows how to use. That's because a lot of countries, including the US, represent money this way. Instead of subpixels, you have something like pennies, which represent fractional portions of a dollar. Add up 100 pennies and you get one whole dollar. Add up some number of subpixels and you get one whole pixel. It's the same idea, just two different applications. Mario 3 in particular uses a scheme where a pixel is divided into 16 subpixels. This gives it enough granularity to allow for smooth acceleration and works well because of how fixed point numbers are stored. For a single byte, instead of using all eight bits to represent a whole value, a fixed point number sets aside some of the bits to denote a fractional part. A common way to handle this is to split the byte down the middle, with the upper four bits containing the sign along with the whole part, and the lower four bits containing the fraction. The game uses this exact format to store Mario's speed, but doesn't use the full possible range of values since his velocity is capped at plus or minus four and a half pixels per frame. Mario's position is also stored using fixed point numbers, but the format is a little different. Both the X and Y coordinates are unsigned values from zero to 255, which means that it takes an entire byte to store each value. So to store his position in terms of subpixels, you need another byte. The idea is to shift the whole part of the number to the left to make room for the fractional part. In this scheme, the first half of the whole part is in one byte, and the second half is in the other, along with the subpixels. Each frame, the game adds the two fixed point values together and stores the result, then converts from subpixels to screen coordinates by performing some bit shifts. This effectively causes the fractional part of the number to fall off, leaving only a single byte-sized integer that can be used to position Mario sprites on the screen. Honestly, this is the secret sauce to smooth movement on the NES. Once you know how to store positions in terms of subpixels and how to convert those values to screen coordinates, the hard part's pretty much done. Now all that's left is to set up the controller code, model the motion using state machines, make the tile graphics, place the sprite, set up the keyframe animations, and implement all of the movement routines. Easy. Well, as far as the controller code is concerned, in order to correctly mimic the movement in a Mario game, you need to keep track of two things. Which buttons are currently being held down and which buttons were pressed as of the current frame. The easiest way to handle this is to just store two button masks, one that shows which buttons are down and the other that shows which buttons were just pressed. 
The code to update the mask is run every frame and is basically just a modified version of the normal controller reading code with a couple extra bitwise operations. If you pay close attention when playing a Mario title, it's pretty easy to deduce how any movement code has to work in order to replicate the feel of the game. The first rule, as I covered earlier, is that Mario smoothly accelerates in response to controller input. This means that whenever he changes speed or direction, it takes some amount of time until he reaches the desired velocity. For walking and running, this change in speed is really straightforward. He always speeds up or slows down by one subpixel per frame. To handle the acceleration, I chose to store two velocity variables instead of one. The first is the character's actual velocity, which is stored in terms of subpixels and added every frame to update the position. The second is the target or desired velocity. The target velocity is set directly according to which buttons are being pressed, then the actual velocity accelerates frame by frame until it reaches the target. For those of you who are familiar with animation software or game engines, this is just basic linear interpolation. For my demo, I decided to break the movement code down into three subroutines. So first routine sets the target velocity based on the controller input by reading the down bit mask and performing some branches, then uses a lookup table to set the speed based on the input direction and the state of the B button. The next routine is used to implement the acceleration. Roughly speaking, it compares the current velocity to the target by taking their difference. If the result is negative, then the current velocity is less than the target, so I increase it by one. If it's positive, then the opposite is true, so I decrease it. The third routine is used to update the character's position based on the current velocity. If the character is moving right, then the velocity is positive, and in this case, it's as simple as adding the two subpixel values together and storing the result. But if the character is moving left, then the velocity becomes negative, which complicates things. Since I stored the position as an unsigned value, I ended up having to invert the velocity and perform a subtraction instead. I'm almost certain that there's some really clever way to handle this using just addition, but my hack worked fine, so I didn't go out of my way to find one. Jumping in aerial movement was a lot simpler to implement, and you only need to use two variables, the Y position and the vertical velocity. Every frame, the game checks the button press bit mass to determine if the A button was activated, and if it was, the character is immediately given a massive upward boost. Once the character is airborne, the velocity is slowly decreased until eventually it reaches the maximum falling speed. For up to 24 frames, as long as the player is holding the A button, the game will only decelerate by a single subpixel. If the player lets go, or those 24 frames have elapsed, then the deceleration increases by fold. Coding this up only required a few additional routines. The first one acts like a wrapper for all of the vertical movement, and it's responsible for checking if the jump button was pressed, along with calling the routines that update the position and velocity if the player is already in the air. The update jump velocity routine performs the logic to handle the deceleration, and the apply velocity y routine updates the vertical position in the exact way that it's done for walking and running. I cleaned up the code a bit using scopes and enumeration, then added some initialization routines along with bounds checking to keep the character on the screen and determine when he lands after a jump. But this wasn't the end of the story, since I still needed to handle the graphics. Compared to the movement code, making the graphics wasn't that bad. I chose to stick with the basic Mario-esque tile set composed of 8x16 sprites and drew up all the assets using YYCar. In order to determine what to draw, I kept track of a general motion state for the character. The state variable basically says whether or not the little guy is standing still, moving on the ground, pivoting, or jumping through the air. To update the state, I wrote a routine that determines how the character is moving based on the current position, velocity, and controller input. Next, I wrote a routine to handle the walking and running animations. The delay between frames is set using a lookup table that I generated using a script, allowing the animation to run faster or slower based on the character speed. The last two routines handle the character's orientation and sprite tiles based on the motion state and heading. The tiles are chosen based on the motion and animation state, then the sprites are placed, flipped, and oriented based on the way that the character is facing. For fun, I also threw in an idle animation that makes the character blink after a couple hundred frames if the player hasn't touched the controller. I was surprised at how much this added, and it felt like a great final touch to a fun and engaging project. All the code is completely open source, heavily commented, and available on GitHub. So if you want to mess around with it or use the code in your own games, have at it. And if you do something particularly cool, definitely let me know in the comments. If you like what I do and you want to see me do bigger and better things, you should definitely support the channel on Patreon. Patrons get a slew of perks, including behind the scenes updates, ad free videos, and other bonus content in between episodes. That's all I got. Thanks for watching the video. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the flip side.